Okay, I think with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the opening plenary session for uh, day three of the annual conference. Uh, very glad to have you all with us. Uh, I'm Mike Frost. I'm the product manager for Tracker here at the University of Oslo. Um, and just am here to introduce the session and then turn the time over to my, my colleague, Bob. Uh, just to give you a sense of what we wanted to do with this session, uh, we're often asked about where we think DHS2 fits within a broader health information system ecosystem, and also kind of how we view interoperability. There's uh, often uh, requests coming to us about how do we categorize DHS2? What are the, the health information areas that we do and don't work in? How do we view interoperating with other uh, systems? And, and quite honestly, we're often difficult to define. Um, there are many global efforts to try to put together a taxonomy of different digital health interventions, and DHS2 crosses a lot of those categories. Largely due, I think, to the fact that uh, our primary mission and the, the features and functionality that we work on, we derive from trying to support Ministry of Health needs, and we think that that's a very uh, important aspect of why DHS2 has been sustainable and successful, and more importantly, that that's how we can achieve data for action, is to meet the needs of those that are on the ground and using the systems, which has often driven DHS2 into various different areas. Uh, also, uh, DHS2, from our perspective, as a kind of underlying bedrock principle to be a free and open source software and to be as interoperable as possible with other systems. Uh, we've always intended for DHS2 to fit in any country environment, whether there's a very established kind of enterprise architecture or whether we're talking about ad hoc linking of various systems. We want DHS2 to be flexible enough to be able to accommodate these, these various scenarios. So we, we have recently made efforts to define this more clearly from our perspective. Um, we have a new web page, uh, dhs2.org slash uh, interoperability, uh, I think, or integration, sorry, integration. Take a look at that page. Uh, you'll get a lot of the information from this session there fleshed out in some detail. That's also where we will continue to update and provide more resu resources and links around integration and interoperability. Um, and our intention is to have DHS2 kind of meet the needs of where you are and in your countries and in your projects. So the Bob Jolip is going to lead us through uh, some discussion here. Bob has been uh, working as a senior implementation engineer with the University of Oslo for some 13 plus years. Um, that title, like many of ours at the university, doesn't really do Bob justice. He works uh, as a lead in interoperability, security, contributing to infrastructure decision. He's often the one coordinating emergency responses. You may recognize him as someone who's come and trained the system admins in your country or who has helped uh, link the DHS2 team from your country to others to build a stronger community. Um, I also think Bob serves a bit as the conscience uh, of DHS2 here. He's often reminding us of the need to be aligned with global standards and principles, which means that he also stays up to date on a lot of those conversations and, and spends a lot of time on committee meetings and phone calls that he wishes he wasn't doing. But uh, really glad to, to nail down Bob today for this plenary session uh, to give us uh, from his experience uh, how we view a bit of DHS2 and how it fits into the health information ecosystem. So with that, I think I'll turn the time over to you, Bob. Thanks, Mike, for that illustrious introduction. Um, and welcome everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, yeah, as Mike was saying, what I'm hoping to do with this session is to sort of introduce a little bit of background and a little bit of where we've come to in terms of how we view our posture around interoperability and try and maybe use this session as a little bit of a sounding board as well and hopefully get some reaction good or bad towards the end of it um so yeah without further ado let me just quickly jump in then I, I i didn't come up with the title for this presentation unfortunately i'm, I'm going to stray a little bit from the title but we have to deal with what's on it, and it starts off talking about ecosystems. So what I will do just very briefly, talk a little bit about ecosystems and why I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that metaphor, in fact. 
um, a little bit of, of touching on architecture. Uh, for the more technical folk, we'll do a little bit of okay, for one or two slides just on what are the features of DHIS2 which support interoperability and perhaps getting into more interesting stuff around what are the shared understandings of metadata required for, for interoperability to work. I point to a couple of examples and then what I really want to get to is just the last two slides where we bring out, where we present the, our kind of principles around uh, approaching interoperability. So, ecosystems. Um, I hope I don't get in trouble for using that image. I just grabbed it somewhere off the internet because it looked nice. Um, an ecosystem, as, is, as you all know, it's, it's a biological concept, right? It's defined on Wikipedia, at least, as a community of living organisms in conjunction with non living components in their environment, interacting as a system. People are interested in ecosystems because of um, growing awareness of environmentalism and, and the like. Um, people have started talking about digital ecosystems. I think the idea has come really from the notion of business ecosystems, um, which, as you see, derive from, from, from the biological stuff. Uh, largely that, that kind of... Um, um, discourse has been around issues of competition and collaboration. Uh, the kind of properties which are interesting from, from ecosystems are things like self-organization and scalability and sustainability. Uh, probably resilience, which is a popular word nowadays, nowadays um, resilience of systems as a result of those three kind of characteristics. It's frequently used in terms of in the context of API and platforms, and you'll hear it used in uh, with respect to DHS2 sometimes. You know, people will talk about the DHS2 as a platform, um, which facilitates the growth or the nurturing of an ecosystem around it. Okay, some things to maybe step back and hold on to. Um, I think this ecosystem metaphor can be very useful, but I think it's worth bearing in mind. First of all, that health information systems, particularly architecture, um, are not natural, right? Um, they're produced by deliberate human action. And when you start looking at production, you need to take into account things like who is doing the product, who is doing the producing, who are they producing for, why, um, and, and the like. Um, the end of the systems, is to enhance health workers' ability to improve health, health outcomes, right? It's not in order for business to flourish. So I think in that sense, there's a little bit of departure from the, the, the business ecosystems kind of, of, of notion, which a lot of it is about how to create environments for, for business to flourish. So yeah, that ecosystem metaphor, I think is very useful or can be useful in achieving the ends of enhancing health workers' ability to improve health outcomes. But um, at least for us, in, I, we don't view the creation of ecosystems as an end in itself. And I've seen this proposed in a, in a number of places. So I can react a little bit to it. I mean, our interoperability posture is not about creating ecosystems. Um, though it can be where they are useful, we, we do. A more, maybe a view which it may be more in touch with our kind of traditional mode of operation um, is around the notion of collaborative projects. Um, anybody's familiar with the work of, of, of uh, Andy Blunden, but all that collaborative projects are seen as kind of the, the the kernel of social scientist or the unit of analysis of anything which has to do with human action, right? If we're talking about social human action, then at the kernel of that is the notion of a collaborative project. So what can we say about collaborative projects in DHIS2? And where does it lead us? Well, People familiar with the literature, the, 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 the HISP literature or mythology or history or whatever you want to call it, will probably be familiar with, with references to the early Scandinavian participatory action research. 
Um, and what that involved was the formation of collaborative projects between system designers and, and unionized workers. Um, so you move into the early HISP days, um, Jörn is probably the best, the, the, the best speaker on this kind of subject. But, um, those early HISP days were certainly characterized by collaborative projects formed between um, HISPs and the National Ministry of Health in, in, in various countries, South Africa being probably the earliest one. An important concept, I think, that underlies sort of both of those notions of, of, of collaborative project is the notion of solidarity. Um, solidarity was, and, and I think remains, a very strong basis for why and how we we bring those uh, those collaborative projects forward in the world another piece another concept i guess which in, which is part of now the the his folklore and history is the notion of networks of action networks of action uh, the famous paper written by yearn and sandeep and eric montero um, what they recognized in that that it wasn't sufficient to see a collaborative project as 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 a as a, a unit on its own but need to be need to be seen in a in a um, more holistic global um, context and the need for much broader collaborative projects which spanned countries continents um, and sectors so yeah that's the, the early notion of collaborative projects within hisp has always been central to to our our kind of mode of action more recently um the range and scope and nature of collaborations and the kind of collaborative projects we engaged in has has become much more complex um at any one moment in time we're involved in a a significant number of different types of projects some very large and some very small i like to think of collaborative projects sometimes as uh, if you think of the the simplest prototype for a collaborative project in human activity is probably taking a walk together, right? Two people get together and decide to take a walk. Um, walking is something that, that humans have, have done and continue to do. People have walked from Syria to Norway, right? People have, have um, taken a walk around a field. Whatever it might be, people are coming together with some reason to... to um, collaborate on an activity currently yeah i mean we've in 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 large scale collaborations with who and pepfar and unicef as well as collaborations with with software other software vendors um uh, open mrs long history with we'll see more of that in a bit more recently we've been talking to the likes of divoc on COVID certificates, rapid pro, long, long history of, of collaboration with the depth of engagement, particularly with other software vendors, um, varies quite a bit. But I think at its at the simplest and least committal, this is like the walk in the park rather than the long march. Um, we simply say, well, here's the API and here are the docs, and you know what you want to do and see if you can do it. And there are fortunately, I think many examples and, and probably some of them quite unknown to us where this has been very successful. And this is something we naturally want to encourage. It's kind of a validation that our API works and that our documentation is suitable when we see these kinds of, of, of uses. Um, sometimes we get involved in more one-on-one -on -one interaction with different vendors uh, to hammer out a common approach or common patterns. Um, this is an example of which I suppose over the last year we've done, we, we've had a lot of discussion with Rapid Pro, for example, along these kind of lines. It's not a short-term thing. We, we really want to go into a lot of depth in terms of what are the actual opportunities to be had in the collaboration. Similarly, I guess with IVOC, um, it's quite expensive to do in terms of setting up regular meetings and doing the homework and and there is a risk sometimes 
when having in-depth intra-vendor discussions like this that you're not always going to be well grounded in terms of what's happening on our um, in the context but we'll return to that subject right at the end uh, often it's sufficiently important or the relationship that you have with the other party is sufficiently important to you that it justifies the effort involved thirdly i guess type of engagement um fun inter implies a kind of longer term architectural perspective. And I think this characterizes, for example, the way in which we've interacted with OpenHIE since its, its inception. Um, yeah, I suppose nearly a decade ago now. I've got a slide on OpenHIE later, so we'll return to that. But my point here, I guess, is to say that from the early days where the collaborative project uh, initially was a relatively simple thing and characterized by a very clear understanding of solidarity of purpose um, those collaborations have become more richer and complex uh, some other challenges uh, this could have been 20 slides i suppose <laughs> some of the challenges that we've encountered generally in in working with integration First of all, I think keeping center our solidarity driven collaborative project with with our country partners in particular as central in all the engagements that we take we, we participate in. Sometimes it's possible to lose track of that, uh, particularly in the excitement of looking at new technological developments and possibilities and, and what have you. Staying in touch with the base is really important. I think we find over and over again, particularly people working quite closely at the core in Oslo, that in the local HISP groups, who often have a much stronger understanding of architectural concerns on the ground uh, than we have back in Oslo. And keeping that very strong, that strong um, connection is, 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 yeah, ongoing challenge. Obviously, rationalizing time and effort. I mean, one I think we've realized and we've talked about recruitment and more recruitment and, and the need for more interoperability engineers and, and, and the like, is that it can be very, very time consuming, uh, particularly if you're involved with lots of one-on-one -on -one interactions or if you're involved in lots of standards committees and discussions and, and the like. There is certainly a need to rationalize. We have had interesting challenges grappling with standards. Um, I think generally, from our perspective, we view standards as very important, as um, key enablers in simplifying a lot of interoperability and integration scenarios. Um, we've participated quite directly with things like ADX, for example, for aggregate data, uh, as as um, part of the technical committees maintaining and developing those standards our gi on our gis side i think we're quite strong um, in terms of very very uh, clear support for the likes of geojson wms tms i think we still support gml also to a certain extent um, we've grappled a bit with fire partly because it's arrived um, with such a bang in a way. Um, I will talk a little bit about fire shortly. Um, hasn't been easy. Um, the other challenge I think we've had historically is dealing with the notion of scope creep. Everybody knows that DHS2 can do a lot of things. And very often people are pressuring DHS2 to do even more things. Um, and historically, I think we've had a tendency to drift into areas where, where um, we probably would be better holding back a bit. I think that the work that's currently going on with this newly formed logistics group is very interesting in that regard, in the sense that they are they are very clearly trying to demarcate in the LMIS world where it is that DHIS2 has a role to play and at what point it's much more useful and beneficial to have have clear interfaces with with other LMIS systems. Um, yeah, in terms of 
interoperability features, I guess, from a more technical perspective, what's provided in DHIS2, which makes interoperability possible. Most important thing is to is to talk of the REST API. Um, it seems almost almost um, trivial to be even mentioning that at this point, but it's not been around forever. I think the REST API really took shape only around 2011, 2012, I suppose. Um, the REST API is something which exposes pretty much all of the functionality of DHIS2. Um, the fact that it's used by the, the DHS2 sort of stock web apps um, means that the, the functionality exposed is fairly complete. <coughs> the documentation is an ongoing moving target. I think, I think that <coughs> at the moment we can say it's, it's, it's pretty strong. It's, it's, almost comprehensive. I don't think we can, we're 100% we complete. Um, it's something that we, we're constantly striving towards. Um, clearly, it's good enough that it enables quite a lot of interoperability um, at present, but yep, that will, that will continue to, to be more, become more rigorous. People who work with DHS2 will know that it has a very flexible metadata model, which, you know, is a, is a blessing and a curse. But having this flexible metadata model, some of the more important aspects of it from an interoperability perspective is that, well, it allows for, for custom attributes. So it's possible to do things like um, create multiple identifiers with different types of entities to be able to make matching between different systems possible. We have very, very primitive support for notifications. Um, I mean, up until quite recently, what we could do is send out an SMS or send out an email. Um, part of a result of our discussions with Rapid Pro, in fact, and also with Divoc, has led to the conclusion that we really need to have much better, much uh, better support for for webhooks, and that's a little bit of functionality is is has been implemented already, but that's going to be a strong a strong focus for um, development of the future. Currently, an API, I always say, it's a little bit like ice cream, right? It's just going to sit there, but you need something that's going to lick the ice cream. Um, so an API is inherently an, a, a passive thing. Uh, with webhooks, we enable a little bit of more active uh, responses to events in the, in the system. Beyond the syntax of things like REST APIs and data models and, and, and the like, um, obviously, for interoperability to work, you need to get into the into the semantics of of what the data actually means. And one of the things that's clear is that if you were to share data between between any kind of systems, it sort of presupposes that there's some some kind of common understanding of of what I call anyway the structural metadata. Um, that consists of things like facility identifiers. Um, it's almost always a starting point to, to, to try to exchange data between any two systems or, or five systems, is they need to have some common understanding of how to identify facilities. And as you grow, go a bit deeper into the sort of metadata ontology, um, things like data sets, data elements, tracked entities, all of these things, um, you need to have some way of, of um, getting a common understanding between systems on them. Similarly, control vocabularies for option sets and categories, code lists, as people often call them. I think all of our communities, not just DHS2, have been grappling with the challenges of how do you actually um, optimally reach and maintain shared understanding of this structural metadata across different systems. The facility registry was proposed 10 years ago as a low hanging fruit to resolve some of the issues of facility identifiers. Um, I don't want to go into all of the detail of that here, but I think many of us know that um, it's not quite as low hanging a fruit as perhaps people, people thought some years back. 
there's a role, I think, uh, for terminology services and standard standardized code systems, ICD 11, SNOMED CT, MEDRA is one we've come across quite re recently. Um, more and more, I think that if we start using standardized code systems, it can potentially ease the burden of translation. But again, there's, it's no silver bullet. We often find that the types of metadata we have, there isn't really a, a um, corresponding standardized code that's useful. Um, we have IP issues to resolve. Some of these code systems are not freely available. It causes a bit of conflict with our, our licensing model of particularly around the metadata packages, which I'm going to come to on the next slide. Yeah. I think people have been around the DHS2 community the last couple of years. One of the things many of you would be aware of are these, these packages, which evolved initially from collaboration between, between the University of Oslo and, and WHO. And the original rationale, at least my understanding, has been that, that they allowed very rapid and simple configuration of DHS2 of what was current WHO guidelines on, on areas like TB, malaria, and HIV. Um, a benefit of that being that then all users who, who use those packages could benefit from having these pre-designed indicators and dashboards and graphs and charts and the like. I don't think it was considered at the time uh, that this had anything to do with interoperability, but, what has happened, I guess, as a kind of unforeseen side effect, is that now, as you start to see a number of systems which effectively have the same packaging of metadata, um, it's actually quite easy to design data exchange flows, right? Whether you do it with, with native DHIS2 or ADX or even with FHIR, um, if you, if you have some kind of, of um, standardizing of the metadata that are in different DHS2 in instances, it becomes, it becomes an attractive interoperability target. And I think we've seen a lot of interest between the last year, particularly around that. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do, at least with the HIV and the COVID aggregates um, package, is to take them to the IHE, to the, to the um, Quality Research and Public Health Technical Committee and produce um, yeah, committee balloted um, uh, standard profiles out of them using ADX. There's ongoing work, I think, within the metadata packages team to investigate different ways and find different resources for for improving the standardization of terminologies. I say where appropriate because sometimes it's been hard to um, find a good fit there. Right, I'm gonna just briefly talk a little bit about FHIR because it is very important and it's something that, that um, I know a lot of our, our, our fellow travelers have invested a lot of time and effort into. Um, it's probably become of increasing interest over the past five years. It's a really exciting thing for anybody who's worked with fire um, and particularly developers get very excited about the richness of the model, the, 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 the um, kind of level of, of energy around it. It's quite challenging, uh, particularly for, for kind of legacy systems, I'd say, or systems which, like DHIS2, are, are, are primarily involved with help, but not entirely. I think we also have been used in education, as a lot of you would know, but also in, in some other areas, food security. Um, putting a, putting a, a, a fire straitjacket on that does, it doesn't quite fit with all of our use cases. So we've grappled a little bit on how best to integrate with, with HL7 fire based um, um, activities. There was a fire adapter, it was developed back in 2019 through our interoperability or integration team. Uh, we're gonna hear a little bit about that in the, in the interoperability session coming up after this. 
Um, my colleague Morton has developed some quite clever Python integration scripts, which act as a little bit of a facade for, for example, presenting our native DHIS2 option sets as fire value sets, our org units as MCSD fire resources. Um, unfortunately, we've seen relatively low adoption of any of that work uh, in the field. And so I think as a exchange between DHS2 and FHIR, I think it's always going to be a bit lossy in the sense that um, um, the data models are, are never going to be 100% the same. And for the moment, I guess most of the actual interoperability work that's gone on, um, I think FHIR has been a little bit on the periphery of that. And that may change over time, but at the moment that's the case. We're following the work on fire, I guess, particularly that's been going on with the WHO smart guidelines and, and within Open HIE. Um, but yeah, many, many challenges and rivers to cross there still. Um, I want to call out a little bit on Open HIE. Uh, it's kind of difficult to talk about interoperability and health in developing countries without without recognizing, I guess, the place that OpenHIE has had in all of that. Um, one of the things I think is really important to point out is that there's not DHIS2 and, and OpenHIE. People often, I mean, I've been engaged with many conversations around this. People say, well, why are you using DHIS2? You should be using OpenHIE or, 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 or some variation on that. Uh, DHS2 is part of OpenHIE, and we have been part of it, not quite the very, very start, but very near the, from the very, very early years. Um, I should say, maybe this is different perspective to some of the other, uh, our other OpenHIE collaborants. I mean, we see OpenHIE as a, as a convening forum for important architectural discussions. Um, and as a, I tend to view architecture as the work of architects, right? Architecture is the practice of what architects do. And OpenHIE has been a, a very rich forum for bringing architects together to, to um, hammer out approaches, um, resolve conflicts, and, and generally, I think, enliven and deepen the discussion around architecture. Uh, we don't really see it as a source of software. Uh, it's not like something that um, um, you download and, and run. Uh, I think some people may have a different perspective on that. Historically, within the OpenHIE community, we, we've been part of the facility registry sub-community before it was part of OpenHIE. Um, we have the HMIS sub-community, community, which is... Um, in fact, run primarily by myself and Morton at the moment. Uh, more recently, uh, and I've been trying to drive this for some years, and I think we're getting better. We've we've seen some involvement of um, other parts of our teams with different communities within OpenHIE, particularly around supply chain terminology. There's been some some participation with the COVID nineteen task force. Um, Elaine is going to kill me because I haven't mentioned the data use community. I mean, again, there's so there's there's quite a deep and long term collaboration with within the whole open HIE space, which which we hope to continue to develop. As I say, I I see it as one of the most fertile forums for architectural discussion currently that we have. I want to point out a few interoperability examples. Um, it's really a shameless plug for the session that's coming up next. Um, and, we, and I want to then move quite quickly to interoperability principles. So we've got uh, OpenMRS, long, long history of, of attempts to get good integration going with OpenMRS. Uh, a very interesting presentation coming up on that. Um, Burkina Faso um, has got a, a really interesting use case. Again, it's about individual data from the periphery towards aggregate data at the center. Um, 
it's a big theme that uh, interesting use cases around AMR and I mean the anybody who's worked with AMR over the years will know that WhoNet is the is the thing um, and we have John Stelling who's the who's the sort of bee's knees of AMR and WhoNet um, working together with Julius describing uh, integration that they've done there. Fire adapter people may be quite interested in what's the fate of the fire adapter where it is now. Um, Ranga will be giving us some some um, progress update on that. So this is just what we were able to talk about in the interoperability session, which is coming up next, but obviously there are many, many more. Probably one of the more interesting things we're looking at currently is talking to Open Function, who are, I mean, they produce a, a, a kind of middleware integration software. Um, and um, it's quite possible that we will end up using open function as the kind of middleware uh, um, software, but also as support in terms of collaborating with open function group around things like COVID digital certificate generation using DIVOC. Okay, so I want to finish off really um, presenting um, some principles which I think we've kind of galva starting to galvanize around as the DHIS2 community um, and bounce them off the rest of the world to get some feedback off you all. As I said, the past 10 years since the birth of REST API, we've seen lots of, of, of developments. We've been involved directly in large numbers of projects, um, some of which should be pointed out, maybe most of which, I don't know, but some of which um, haven't actually borne a lot of fruit, but have consumed a lot of cycles. Um, DHS2 is very, very far from perfect. We've got lots of warts, lots of rough spots, um, but I think continues to evolve in, in, in a good direction. But we've galvanized as a team around the set of, of six guiding principles. I'll just run by you here now, and then we'll stop. But firstly, I can't actually, I want to get rid of all of these cameras so that I can see what I'm doing. Okay, good. Yeah, the role of DHIS2 and his, in keeping with our 25 year historical mission is to act always in solidarity with our country partners. And I've brought up so, solidarity again. Bob, Bob, just to mention, because I think we're, we're stuck on your open HIE slide. I don't know if you've advanced already to the slide with the, the principles. Oh, my screen sharing is paused, you see. Okay, sorry about that. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, resume share, you have me. Okay, we can see you now on the, the full presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna get back down to where I was there. Uh, there's my little thing to make me go full screen. Okay, you see that principles. Yes. Yeah, first principle, and I think this is this is the most important principle, and it's one that we want to keep um, very much at the forefront is that the role role of DHS two um, is to act always in solidarity with our country partners, um, and this includes particularly when we're in, engaged with with many other collaborations with many other vendors and partners and funders and whatever it might be central to our collaborative project is the solidarity with our country partners. Um, resulting from that, I guess, is that all interoperability efforts, that particularly ones that we play a direct role in, should have a clearly identified use value to the end users and system owners, which kind of implies that they need to be involved from the start, informed, I say, by their direct input of what is useful. We've seen, unfortunately, too many interoperability projects where, where data has sometimes flowed, um, maybe not, or maybe for a very short time, but not sufficient thought has been put into, well, what's the use of that? And the use for whom? We want to keep that central. The interoperability use value has got to be balanced against the cost, right? Um, um, often, people will say we want to have this system talking to that system 
uh, without a, without a sense first of well what's the value in doing what's the use value in doing that and how expensive is it to do it um, it's important that that um, we we keep this balance um, at the forefront when we're evaluating what kind of engagement that we need we would like to have or we would encourage our his partners to have uh fourthly um and this is this is lesson from bitter experience i suppose is when you're talking about integration don't start with talking with the vendors of different systems who produce um it's much more fruitful to start with having data conversations between the data controllers or data users the program managers about well, what's useful um if we have a clear emphasis on what is the data use that's being reinforced by interoperability then we can have much more informed discussions with vendors about what kind of data flows are important um, fifthly i've mentioned i think that the important thing to me about architecture is well who are the architects right architecture who is who is doing the architectural practice uh, very often uh, there are country level architects who are, are, are bypassed or ignored in the in, in the discussion um working with country level architects um influencing them where possible if they don't exist facilitate their emergence um where we have local hisps his country teams regional teams ensure those hisps are involved in in the architectural discussion and not simply focused on the dhis too um and sixthly um we view it as incredibly important and beneficial to to participate in go, in global collaborative processes i think i think that they inform a lot of our activity on the ground um, and it's sharing expertise and and the like so global collaborative processes around interoperability and architecture and standards participation in standards bodies i think is really very important but all of this, you know, with with a very, very strong foot on the ground. So that's it, really, that all I was going to present to you all. What I'm really quite interested at this point is to try to get some reaction, particularly on our six principles, um, whether they are offensive, useful, in need of further elaboration, um, etc. Otherwise, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Sure. So we have, uh, I can see John Lewis has his hand raised there. John, do you want to unmute and uh, tell Bob that he's he's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's nothing about wrong. It's, um, you know, the, these six principles are very good and uh, we all agree. Not only in DHS two community, but like in uh, in many like like whether it is Open MRS, like everyone like who, who deals with open standards or things, this is how it has to go. Whether it is on Open HIE, uh, all the other things. But now, like my problem is like when we are trying to promote this one in in the Minister of Health level in in our countries in the low resource set settings and just saying okay these are things, and they think this is DHS two standards. Uh, you are from DHS, so you only want to use these standards. So I guess like it's somewhere it, it gets into, yes, like we adopt these standards, but they, uh, at the, um, the Ministry of Health level, they think, especially these uh, different vendors, the uh, Ministry of Health don't really know much about the IT system at all. Uh, so they just say, oh, these are DHS standards. But this is not DHS, these are just like a normal global standards, which has to be which data has to adopt to it and like they, you're using it and changing it to meet the global standards um my thing is like if we can try to as a community uh, come around together like we have who work package if we can have this um the standard as a separate one 
doesn't have to be so much onto the DHR. So they say these are uh, global standards. Like if a Ministry of Health wants to get into building a, a COVID self-registration module or COVID vaccine module or other things, these are some uh, something which they have to think through rather than just like going back to 20 years back when they're just like uh, doing things in a, in a very silo matter. Because most of the developers country, they know about this one, they, they include it. But in low resource uh, settings, the countries where we don't really know, the, uh, the message has not reached yet. And every time like the, the his um, members or things, we want to try to educate on things, it's always, um, it is interpreted as these are DHS2 standards, not as um, uh, global standards. So maybe we can try to include something on that one. Thanks. John, are you suggesting, first of all, when you talk about standards, you're talking about these principles. Um, yes, yes. Are you suggesting that we should be elevating these principles to a more broader audience than just than just DHIS2? No, I'm I think, just like, uh, the, I think we, we can try to lead by example. Um, yes. And, but like, I'm just listening, these are the things, right? So, but when we are talking about it, the people think because we are promoting DHRS too. That's what all the people they, they think from. But it's it's nothing to do with DHS, like PSI, um, which they used in Vietnam or other place. They have their own app and other things. They talk to to DHRS to send the data. Perfectly fine. All these major uh, actors they know about these standards, but not the Ministry of Health. And Ministry of Health, uh, they get into developing small uh, from their own local company and other things. Uh, they just say sending the data, they will download it in Excel and then like upload it up, all the patient data and everything. So there are this kind of problems what we're facing. Um, I guess like when we talk about this one, like maybe open HIE or anything, like we are trying to promote, but like in, instead of like just like diverting to towards DHS too. Because these all the things, it's it's nothing to do with the DHS two itself. Yes, we are doing it in our principle, but it can also be a bit more, like say, um, the guidelines. Uh, um, maybe like um, other people can uh, from the field uh, mm. can uh, uh, clarify. So I'm, I'm not sure I see another clarification on that point, but there is one that come up that uh, may be fun to respond to. So uh, a question from the chat was for principle four, where you said, don't start with the vendors of systems. Does DHS2 classify as a vendor? And if not, why not? Yeah, um, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I had a grappled a bit with that word. Um, um, it's, I don't know if there's a better word for it, but as as we produce a product, right? We produce DHIS two. It's open source. People can download it and and, and use it. Um, but there is a sense in which we are a vendor. I'm not sure if there's a better word for that. Some sort of the producers of systems or whatever it might be. But yeah, I in the way I'm using the word vendor, I would say yes, DHIS. Uh, or, or the University of Oslo uh, classifies as a vendor, um, but I'm not using it in the sense of, of you put money in your vending machine and and get the can of coke out. Maybe maybe vendor implies a more commercial exchange. I don't know. I I think it's also worth saying from our side. I mean, we we do straddle that line a bit, but we also from the University of Oslo, we always consider ourselves a university first with a research program attached to it. That doesn't mean that you or your country need to trust that, but this is the angle that at least we come from and that kind of guides the, the things that we choose to work on and the principles that we we promote. So we're, we're offering a free open source platform. Uh, people can take or lose, but we also think very much in terms of, you know, from an outside perspective, you'll see that research coming out of the University of Oslo also is critical of DHS2 at times in, in what we're doing. And we try to learn from that and grow from that. So 
anyway, it's it's again very much up to up to the the country how they view that. And I think we would all feel comfortable saying don't don't trust DHS two either. I mean, take a look and see what makes the most sense in terms of data flow and what is the the data need that you have. Does the system work? We we don't think of DHS two as being perfect, and we don't think of it as covering every possible use case. Um, so I don't know if you want to add any more to that, Bob. Let us just kind of, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very open to suggestion to a better way than vendors. I mean, like when we deal with open MRS and rapid pro, and I mean, these are all produced by different groups with different kinds of, of, of organization. Um, there's a sense in which they are all vendors of systems, but I'm happy to use a different word <laughs> if, if, if somebody has got one for me. Okay, so I've got I've got a hand raised here from Adam. Uh, Adam, do you want to jump in? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thank you uh, both for this uh, presentation. I think this is uh, highly welcome, uh, given the context in which we are now, and particularly in uh, uh, countries in West and Central Africa, where uh, people believe interoperability is now a sort of uh, uh, magic word to skip uh, to escape uh, criticism about uh, duplicating system or uh, implementing uh, fragmented uh, ecosystem in uh, in Africa. So I think I and I hope that we have uh, many partners uh, in uh, in this uh, session. So uh, on the principles, I think. Uh, what I would suggest is that uh, first we we need to have a sort of uh, uh, readiness uh, uh, checklist or tools or whatever for countries and stakeholders to know if a country uh, what it takes to have interoperable systems and if the country is ready for it. Because uh, often when uh, these uh, initiatives come, uh, sometimes they don't even know who to talk to. Is it uh, the technical people? Is it the, the decision makers? Uh, who are we going to talk to? And uh, from what you said in this presentation, it is clear that we need to talk to many people, the program managers, uh, the users, the IT people, the sometimes the politicians and so forth. So. I think we need to have this kind of uh, tool in place to, to help people in knowing what to do and, uh, and uh, who to, to talk to. Uh, the other points I have regarding the, the sixth principle is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good attempt, but uh, as we all know, the, uh, the entry barrier for uh, this kind of uh, arenas is very high and it's not uh, given to countries or people in countries to, uh, to participate in this kind of arenas and uh, get their voice heard. So I know there is no uh, magic solution for it, but uh, we need to think of how can we uh, make it uh, possible as much as possible. Thank you. Good, thanks, thanks, Adam. And I, I, you touched a little bit on operationalizing, um, which I haven't really got around to in this presentation. Some of the things like like checklists for for um, architectural discussions and the like. But we are working in that direction at the moment. Um, yeah, thanks. Mike, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I think we just have time for one more question. I see Scott has his hand raised as one of our researchers here at the university, probably to disagree with uh, how we described a vendor. Scott, uh, <laughs> you. Oh, great. So then I can unmute myself now. No, I, I don't disagree at all. Um, well, I have some other thoughts, but that's I'll put those in the chat. Uh, <laughs> I actually just wanted to say I really appreciated the uh, historical and kind of theoretical framing, Bob, that you did of the presentation. I thought that was really illuminating and not something that really we hear a lot of. And it strung together a lot of different uh, elements that kind of shape the larger approach. I was going to ask, you know, kind of a practical question. You have um, been in a lot of interoperability projects. At what point, you know, many of those are unsuccessful, unfortunately, and, and at what point 
do you think there are diminishing returns or maybe to use like the classic analogy by Nora Stoops, uh, kicking it, you know, trying to get a dead horse or trying to ride a dead horse, right? When, when is it that the interoperability project is, is failed? Does it ever fail? And at what point should countries like reconsider the interoperability approach? Do I hear the cynical answer or the... Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's when the money runs out, Scott. I mean, a lot of interoperability projects will run as long as they are funded to run, regardless of what use value is being delivered on the ground. And the point where you pull the plug is when the funding gets pulled. Um, okay, that's 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 the cynical answer. I think that yeah, sometimes sometimes projects seem to have failed, and they somehow. Um, they, they re-emerge in a better form. I mean, I, I think the Open MRS report module, I actually wrote the first Open MRS DHIS2 module for reporting to DHIS 10 years ago. It was kind of horrible. Um, I think it still works too, in some, some state in India, in Himachal Pradesh. But generally, it was really very horrible and not, not something I was very proud of. But I'm really pleased to see that there's new work has come along where uh, people have created a new DHIS2 module uh, and fixed all the horrible things in the early one. So sometimes, you know, there is a phoenix that emerges from ashes of, of, of bad interoperability projects. Um, but though, so in terms of, of, you know, when to pull out or when to pull the plug, I think it depends a lot on the nature of the collaboration that you have with the partners that are involved as well but very often it's about when the money stops of course that raises the question whoever has control of the money when should they stop the money okay i i would love to keep talking forever but i think that we we better give some time for the, the next sessions uh, that people are going to be dispersing to but wanted to say thank you very much bob for uh for your transparent and interesting presentation with us we we are always open to to feedback on these things and are constantly learning from the what we learn or hear from the community so please take a look i i did put a link to the the website where we've started to elaborate on these points uh, dhs2.org integration uh, feel free to take a look uh, we're happy to hear from you and if you're interested in the topic of interoperability as bob says there's a session coming up uh, just now this afternoon so take a look for that so thank you everyone thank you again bob thanks for all those that participated and uh, we'll see you in the next sessions